Well, um, the title I've chosen for our lesson today is too lengthy, I know. I'm the king of long titledness, titles, uh, pithiness is not uh, part of my DNA, I guess, but I despaired of leaving any single part out of it for Luke's account concluding this seventh chapter of his gospel does indeed concern itself with sin and forgiveness and the love that is its consequence. And the three actors who occupy the scene and improve the message are indeed Jesus Christ, a sinful woman, and an unidentified Pharisee. Forgiveness, said the old Presbyterian minister Clarence Edward McCartney, is the language spoken in heaven by the angels and the redeemed. It will be the only language spoken there. No other language will be understood. It will be spoken by the cherubim and the seraphim and the whole angelic host as they praise God, the author of forgiveness and eternal salvation. It will be spoken by all the redeemed as they greet one another on the banks of the river of life and gather round the throne of the Lamb and sing their song unto him who loved them and washed them from their sins. But no one can learn that language after he gets to heaven. It must be learned here upon earth in this world and in this life. Our account this morning is, as usual, one familiar to us. A Pharisee has invited Jesus to a meal uh, during the course of it. A woman described as a sinner uh, comes up behind Jesus and begins to anoint his feet with perfume. The Pharisee objects, and then the episode reaches its climax with Jesus affirming that the sinful woman's sins have been forgiven. It's yet another example of how Jesus came into the world to seek and to save suffering sinners and would let nothing stand in the way of his offer of free forgiveness for all who would gratefully receive it. This is one of two uh, somewhat uh, similar anointing accounts given to us by the gospel writers. And those cross references are listed probably in the margin of uh, your text from Matthew and Mark and John. Uh, but Luke's uh, comes much earlier in the life of Jesus than the other three gospel accounts. And there are differences, uh, clear differences. The other anointing occurs much late, later, uh, shortly before uh, Christ's arrest and crucifixion. According to John, uh, the woman involved is Mary of Bethany, the sister of Martha and Lazarus, and not the sinful woman. And the point of contention <clears throat> was not who was doing the anointing, the sinful woman, but whether the expensive perfume might not rather have been used uh, to help the poor. So as we begin reading, uh, we uh, encounter an incident in its own right. Uh, the chronology is not certain, though easily in the flow of Luke's uh, chronicle. Perhaps in the persons of the Pharisee and the sinful woman, we have Luke's examples of the two categories summarized by the Lord just before in verse 34. I know it's been a while since we read that, but look there. Verse 34, these fastidious Jewish leaders uh, complaining at his association with sinners. So here, no, here now are examples of each. So beginning in verse 36, uh, we read, now one of the Pharisees was re requesting him to dine with him. And he entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And there was a woman in the city who was a sinner. And when she learned that he was reclining at the table at the Pharisee's house, she uh, brought an alabaster vial of perfume. And standing behind him at his feet, uh, weeping, she began to wet uh, his feet with her tears and, and kept wiping them with the hair of her head and kissing his feet and 
anointing them with the perfume. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who and what sort of person this woman is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. And Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he replied, say it, teacher. A money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they were unable to repay, he graciously forgave them both. So which one of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, you have judged correctly. Turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house, you gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but uh, she anointed my feet with perfume. For this reason, I say to you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. Then he said to her, your sins have been forgiven. And those who were reclining at the table with him began to say to themselves, who is this man who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Well, it was three Sundays ago now that Dan in our Lord's Supper meeting read to us out of Matthew chapter 11, the, the final verses of that chapter. And the context there, remember, is the increasing resistance to Jesus among the Jews and among the cities of the Jews. And it, it, it appears from a reading of all of the Gospels, including Luke, that the Lord was on some kind of a journey. Uh, he had gone uh, from Capernaum to Nain, remember the widow of Nain, and then to the place where John the ba Baptist's disciples uh, had come to question him. And somewhere then he concluded with the exhortation which Dan read, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It's extremely likely that the woman who was a sinner in uh, Luke's now description had surely availed herself of that invitation of the Lord. Sometime in the very recent past, uh, just as so many of us here uh, this morning uh, have. She had learned from it to use Jesus' urgent recommendation. And she was now in this place uh, described here by Luke, exulting in it, uh, wearing in it, if you will, wearing it, if you will, overcome by it even. She was overwhelmed by love for the one had, who had given to her such a precious gift, forgiveness. The Pharisee who hosted the meal and invited Jesus was named Simon. I called him an unidentified uh, Pharisee earlier, so that's not entirely true, but we know little of him besides that. As to why he initiated this invitation, we can only speculate. There's no evidence that, unlike uh, Nicodemus, uh, perhaps, he felt any favorable attraction uh, to Jesus. He, he may have been just curious to meet the talk of the town, for that is who Jesus uh, was. Or perhaps he wanted a chance to challenge him. That would have been a pharisaical thing to do. In any event, Jesus himself 
was underscoring his willingness to meet with whoever uh, sought his audience. He had chosen to dine with uh, Levi, the tax collector, and he would dine with this Pharisee as well. And we know the custom of the time. Uh, for a dinner such as this, the guests would uh, recline on cushions around a low table, uh, leaning in, elbows forward with their feet extending out uh, behind them so that Luke advises us that uh, Jesus had entered the house and, and reclined at this table. That makes my back hurt uh, to think about that. I, th I think I would have preferred uh, Leonardo da Vinci's table where you could sit in normal chairs, but that's the way we know that's the way they did it. But in verse 37, we're, we're quickly introduced to another protagonist, uh, an important one at that. That's indicated by Luke's use of the common uh, Greek interjection, behold. Now, it's not translated in most of our uh, versions, probably because our attention is already uh, drawn sufficiently to her by Luke's further description of her as a sinner, uh, most likely meaning that she had a reputation as a prostitute. So here is uh, the, the notable thing, uh, not so much that the Pharisee was hosting the Lord, that, but that it became the occasion for this <clears throat> specific woman to make her appearance. She now takes center stage. Luke tells us that when she learned that Jesus had come to Simon's house for this meal, she brought an alabaster vial of perfume and she went there. Now a little explanation is, is in order. A dinner such as this was likely uh, not the kind of intimate affair we might uh, think. It was not strictly private and it was quite common for an, un, for an interested party to be able to come in and uh, take a seat uh, as an observer, uh, not reclining at table with the guests or the guests, uh, but uh, still sitting nearby and even engaging in conversation, sometimes joining in. Uh, the long-necked alabaster bottle of perfume she had with her would not have been unusual. Uh, literature from the period describes it as customary for Jewish ladies to wear such a perfume flask uh, even around their neck. In this case, uh, she would not have ventured to the Pharisee's house without it, for it becomes evident that sometime before, as I said, she had been touched by the Savior's words uh, somewhere. Uh, recently, no doubt, she had had an encounter with Jesus, the forgiver of sinners, and she had experienced uh, the overwhelming joy of pardon for her sins and a newfound hope and status previously unknown to her. And the typical alabaster vial of perfume had a long neck that had to be uh, broken in order to pour out its contents, and she intended to break it this day. It would have been natural for her to approach the Lord from behind him at his feet. Uh, the first thing a visitor did upon entering a host's home was to take off his sandals, uh, dirty from the walk there, so Jesus' feet would have been bare. So she made her way uh, that far when suddenly it seems she was overcome in his presence. And she let her emotions uh, get the best of her. She suddenly broke out uh, crying and she couldn't control her, her tears as they gushed out and, and fell upon his unwashed feet and spontaneously it seems she began to wipe his uh, tear-drenched feet with her hair. That means in her emotional state she had quickly let down her hair to perform what one would ordinarily do with a towel except she had none uh, without thought to the impropriety of, of loosening her hair like that. The Talmud taught that a woman was to never loosen her hair in public unless in the presence of her husband. 
but she, she was either oblivious to that at the moment or she didn't care and her unbridled emotions, you can see it in the text, began to avalanche from uh, furiously wiping his feet to actually kissing them and, and finally breaking the bottle of perfume and not daring to anoint him on uh, his head, instead anointing his feet with the precious perfume. She was the picture of the repentant and forgiven sinner suddenly overcome with the joy and surprise of the love of God. It was the servant's uh, duty, the slaves, to tend to the traveler's dirty feet. And at the moment, she knew she was no better than that. And in deep humility, she spilled forth her gratitude with a jumble of desperate expressions of it, uh, heedless to the jumbled mess of her now hanging damp hair and the besmudged feet of the Lord, now redolent with the aroma of perfume. Her past had been erased at the ministrations of this man. She had heard him say it, come unto me, and she had come. And now her response was the unabashed expression of love and the purity of deep, deep gratitude. It was the only self-awareness belonging to her at the moment, and Jesus completely understood. Not so much the host. The Pharisee was indignant. In verse 39, uh, when he saw the scene unfolding, he began surmising to himself in the most human way, racing to negative conclusions about both the woman and, more importantly, Jesus. He said to himself, uh, here it is in, in, the, in the text, if this man were a prophet, as some people were saying, uh, he would know who and what sort of person this woman is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. She is a sinner. So here is how the mind works for whom God's grace and love is an alien concept. It's devilishly logical. First, if this man were a prophet, he would know what sort of woman this is who's anointing his feet. Second, if he knew what kind of woman uh, she was, he would not allow it. And, and, and then thirdly, since he's allowing such actions, he cannot be a prophet and, and shouldn't be acknowledged as one. It was the perfect reasoning of the moralist. Uh, the self-deluded moralist begins with the belief that his own moral standards are the baseline of acceptable behavior and then proceeds with the vanity of thinking others' behavior must conform to his. His failure, however, is in not understanding the emptiness of his own morality and its complete inadequacy before the judgment of God, the only one whose evaluation means anything at all, which is the seedbed of grace. It's where it originates. Uh, not in the foolish imaginations of the self-righteous, but in the honest despair of the desperately guilty who have come to understand their own sinfulness. Yes, this woman was a sinner, and she knew it. And the Pharisee uh, pr proudly knew she was as well, but wanted Jesus' concurrence. Did he not know who and what sort of person this woman is. But Jesus does know it. He does know it. He knows what is in the heart of every human being. For he is more than a prophet. He is the friend of sinners. And now he proceeds uh, to shock his host by gladly revealing his willingness to not only receive the sinner's caresses, but to exp express his pres preference for her kindnesses over his. And he does it by, this is brilliant, he is the Lord Jesus Christ. He does it by entering into the Pharisee's own habit of, of thinking. 
uh, through the use of a riddle of sorts, uh, perfectly formulated for him alone and indicating that he knew Simon as well as he knew the woman. And to ensure his undivided attention, the Lord in verse 40 uh, couches it as something of, of a request that requires an answer. I have something to say to you, uh, Simon, may I? And Simon somewhat grudgingly invites him, say it, teacher. So Jesus offers uh, the riddle up concisely for us in verses 41 and 42. Here we read it again. A mon money lender had two uh, debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they were unable to repay, he graciously forgave them both. So which of them will love him more? Of course, the riddle is not about money or monetary debts. The debtors depicted are figurative for sinners uh, whose debt is the sin that they've piled up. The denarius, you probably recall, was the Roman coin with the value approximate to what a laborer would receive for a day's wage. I think that's in the, the margin. So while a 50 denarii uh, debt uh, might have seemed uh, burdensome enough, a 500 uh, denarii debt would have been formidable indeed. Applied to the circumstances of the event, uh, Jesus was pointing to the Pharisees' perception of the vast difference between himself and the woman. We must suppose he understood the Lord's intent. And so even if he admitted uh, to some sin on his own part, which he would not, but 50 denarii's worth, say, uh, that was nothing compared to the overwhelming debt of sin weighing her down. She was a 500 denarii sinner. But the trap in the riddle for the Pharisee was that still they were both sinners. Both had debts they were unable to pay, yet the Pharisee imagined that he had amassed this surplus of negotiable assets at his disposal that would more than make up for any perceived debt. This is the tried and true belief of the average man on the street, isn't it? It's what keeps him going, what he holds close to his heart, that his moral goodness or his altruism or his church going or the balance of his deeds, whether good or bad, tilting slightly to the good as he sees it. These, these amount to a kind of get out of jail free uh, card, which will purchase for him God's admittance to the, you know, wink, wink, pearly gates when his time finally comes. What he does not know, or he refuses to acknowledge, is that the sinner's currency is worthless, rendering him insolvent before our holy God. This is what the sinful woman fully understood, but the pious Pharisee did not. She needed something she did not have, the removal of her sins from her account. And Jesus had come to her uh, for that very purpose and, and volunteered uh, to take her sins upon himself while at the same time earning for her, not some laughable board game gimmick allowing her to roll the dice one final time, but the very righteousness of holy God reckoned to her account. He had written her a promissory, promissory note, negotiable in heaven, guaranteeing her acceptance there. So appearances in this life are not everything. We, we don't know precisely uh, what this woman's uh, life uh, looked like uh, before. We have a better idea of the Pharisees. We know enough, however, about both 
that we can interpret uh, the riddle. Uh, the Pharisee was the one whose mere 50 denarii debt had been figuratively absolved, but the sinful woman's debt was 10 times that. So Jesus, closing in now on his prey, asked the obvious question in verse 42, having forgiven both, which of them will love him more? Now the Pharisee realizes he's been caught in something, and so with a, a sense of defeated resignation or arrogant dismissiveness or perhaps even affected indifference, he, he grudgingly answers, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And the Lord responds, well, yes, of course, you've, you've, judged, uh, you've judged correctly. But then the scene unfolds more dramatically as the Lord brings to fore the great contrast uh, before him. Luke tells us that Jesus turned toward the woman. So we must picture that in our minds. He turned his, his body and his attention toward the woman and directed the Pharisee to do the same. But he directed uh, his indicting comments to Simon alone. Do you see this woman? Do you see this woman? Of course he saw the woman. She was the foil for his delusional thinking uh, that he had the moral upper hand. He had taken pleasure in measuring his own righteousness against the woman known as a sinner. But now Jesus turns the tables on him by pointing out the obvious, either out of positive contempt for Jesus or passive disrespect or simple neglect, he had failed, Simon had failed to extend to him some of the, some of the most basic customary expressions of hospitality. He, there are three that the Lord identifies. We, we know about these in our studies. Uh, uh, each time he contrasts the omission of Simon with the woman's actions. There, there was first the provision of water for the washing of his guest's feet. Now that may not have been a strictly held custom, but if a guest did happen uh, to arrive on foot, especially a special uh, important guest, it was common to provide such a kindness to water for their, to clean their feet. Second, Simon had not uh, offered his guests a kiss upon his arrival. That, that sort of gesture was common in Eastern cultures, indicating the guest was welcome and the visit was pleasing uh, to the host. And we enact something of the same thing today, the kind of half hug and the almost kiss on, on the cheek. And then the Lord went on, Simon had not anointed his head with oil. It's the word for olive oil, cheap, and uh, a cheap and readily available commodity in those environs. That would have been an act uh, beyond normal hospitality. But the point Jesus was making was that in contrast to this expensive perfume the woman had used in anointing Jesus' feet, G, uh, uh, Simon had not even sprung for a dab of, of olive oil for his head. And all the while, remember, Jesus was looking at the woman, looking at the woman, because this was the distinction he wished to make. In contrast to Simon, Jesus points out, the sinful woman anointed his feet with perfume, kissed his feet repeatedly, and washed his feet with tears of gratitude, wiping them with her own hair. Simon had seen her do all this. Jesus is insisting that he look upon her as he recites her actions. And whereas before uh, Simon had looked upon her with contempt, now he sees her in contrast with himself, who Jesus subtly condemns now, uh, painfully uh, repeating, you didn't, you didn't, you didn't. 
But then comes <clears throat> in verse 47, the, the coup de grace. For this reason I say to you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. Now it's possible to misunderstand the Lord's concluding comment to his host and think for a moment he meant that the reason behind her sins having been forgiven was that she loved much. Her sins were forgiven her on account of her acts of love toward Jesus. But that would be a non-biblical uh, idea. We will not find in the Bible any assertion that a person's love for another or even love for God merits forgiveness of sins. Rather, what Jesus was saying and, and looking at it from the perspective, again, of him addressing the, the Pharisee, but looking at the woman was, here is the reason I'm saying this to you. Her sins, uh, which are many, and note, he doesn't try to cover them up or deny them, uh, but instead underscores it. Her sins, which are many, have been forgiven. And the evidence for what I'm telling you is what you just witnessed and I just described. She loved much. She loved deeply and humbly and tenderly and continuously. She is filled with love for her Savior. And that is how I can say that her sins have been forgiven. Because she's been forgiven, she loves. And let's one think that that is an exercise in forced exegesis. The next clause seals it. But he who is forgiven little loves little. He turns it around on this deluded uh, Pharisee. You can tell by your own behavior and lack of love, you have revealed how little you understand the magnitude of your sin and your own need for forgiveness. That was Anselm's rebuttal to his opponent, Boso, in that seminal work that we often quote from, Cur Deus Homo, why the God-man? Why did God become man? And, and Anselm uh, said to him, uh, he, he, he said to him, have you not yet considered what a grievous weight sin is? And those who do comprehend that respond in kind. Where there's much forgiveness, is there not much love? And where there's little or no forgiveness, is there not little, little love? Well, finally, with his eyes still firmly on the woman, Jesus addresses her, for all we know, for the first time, speaks to her. He said to her, your sins have been forgiven. Your sins have been forgiven. It was not a pronouncement so much as a confirmation of what Jesus had already spoken. Her sins had been forgiven, meaning they remain forgiven, uh, despite perhaps the Pharisees' indignation. More importantly, he was personalizing it. For the forgiveness of sins and the salvation God brings to his own through Jesus is personal to each. Every redeemed child of God is the personal object of the particular and saving love of God, effectually aimed at each from eternity past. He spoke the forgiving words to the sinful woman personally. And Jesus, as you know, would emphasize that more and more as he drew closer to the fulfillment of his mission. The Apostle John recorded it in the 10th chapter of his gospel. Jesus was the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. 
His Father gave each one of them to him, and no one would be able to snatch any of them out of his hand. And as he spoke those words, he told his disciples he had other sheep, and he must uh, bring them also. So there exists for the Lord Jesus Christ a divine necessity to personally bring each into the forgiveness of sins and into salvation. He must. How those words, your sins have been forgiven, must have penetrated this woman's heart, affirming the miracle that had happened in her life. Just like all of us, the miracle that has happened in our life. But to those around the supper table, <clears throat> listening, the statement was unusual and disturbing. Who is this man, they muttered, who even forgives sins? But Jesus ignored the noise, and in the final verse of the chapter, uh, Luke records the beautiful words of clarity spoken lastly by the Lord. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. With forgiveness comes salvation. The instrument by which the woman had received it was, as always, only faith, and the familiar farewell common to Judaism, go in peace, under the circumstances, carried with it the fuller meaning, uh, familiar to every uh, redeemed sinner, of the warm security found under the shelter of his wings. The sinful woman had found rest for her soul. Well, that's what happened when Simon the Pharisee invited Jesus Christ to his home for a meal. As we reflect upon Luke's account and the lesson from the side story that became the main story, I find it interesting, but also agreeable, uh, that down through the centuries since that event, this woman is commonly referred to as the sinful woman. She's the sinful woman. Mark, someone asked me last week, what are, you, what are we studying next week? Well, it's Luke 7. We're studying the sinful woman and the Pharisee. That is her eponym in the history of the church, the sinful woman, the sinful woman. But the truth is that's a title that we all wear. Uh, none have the means to pay the debt we owe of our own resources because we are all sinners and bankrupt in the eyes of God. But by God's grace, all who have received the new birth and responded to his effectual call, coming to him in faith in Christ, wear also the wonderfully amended title, Forgiven Sinner. Just like the sinful woman, uh, Jesus has given to us such a precious gift. And the Christian life is one we are called to live in response to that, the, the response of a grateful heart. Gratitude and love are at the very least what the Lord expects from us. And the sinful woman, whose display of love was the result of Jesus' forgiveness, uh, shows us the way. I quoted from McCartney at the start. It's the language of the redeemed, and no one can learn that language after he gets to heaven. It must be learned here upon earth, in this world, and in this life. Have we been forgiven much? Uh, do we speak its language? Uh, do we love much? A very convicting uh, passage of scripture for your teacher. Um, do we love much? Uh, do we show gratitude? How do you show gratitude for the forgiveness, for the salvation that the Lord has given you so graciously and merc mercifully? Uh, what expression, uh, I don't mean to point at you, uh, how do we do it? How are we doing it? Are we showing love? She sets the example for us. Well, may the Lord 
enable us to do that more and more. Father, thank you for this uh, <coughs> wonderful uh, scene that occurred when Jesus walked the earth and he was seeking people like that woman and she was offering, and he was offering uh, words of great comfort and encouragement and hope and forgiveness and salvation. And uh, you opened her heart to believe it. Thank you for doing that in our hearts and all these uh, people, uh, friends, uh, members who are so precious to you that you sent your son to die for us. We ask, Lord, that you would more and more turn our hearts, soften our hearts so that uh, we turn from selfishness and, and idle pursuits and uh, we, we rid ourselves of uh, the things the author of Hebrews speaks of uh, and, and, and we run the race and we show love and gratitude. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.